Well, we've got a nice little uh, introduction here with our good friend Ron Charles, who's probably the most uh, present of the Washington Post guys and gals that come here for the fiction there every year. So I want to welcome you, and you're back to back. You'll be doing one right after this. Right. So. Ron writes uh, book reviews for the Washington Post. He said that's enough to say about him, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so he's going to introduce and have a nice conversation with Susan Choi. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. First, a word of thanks to the co-chairman of the festival, David Rubenstein, and the other generous sponsors who've made this event possible. And if you'd like to add your financial donation to this event, please note information in your program. We will have time for questions after this conversation. So uh, I've been asked to remind you that if you come to the mic and ask a question, you will be recorded in the video that's being made and will be shown later. So if you're you know, in a witless relocation program or something, <laughs> just, just stay in your seat. Our guest today is Susan Choi. She's the author of five novels, including American Woman, which is a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and A Person of Interest, which was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award. She's a recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. She teaches fiction writing at Yale, and her new book is Wry and Brilliant. It's called The Trust Exercise. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. I have loved all your novels. They're super smart, very witty. The trust exercise on one level is about a group of high school students who revolve around a charismatic drama teacher at an elite academy of the performing arts in the 1980s. What is it that makes the academic setting so attractive to you as a fiction writer? Because you're just great at it. Is it attractive or is it irresistible? Or are those the same things? You know, a friend of mine once said to me after my third book, you just can't leave the academic setting alone, can you? And I was sort of shamed. Um, you hadn't noticed? I hadn't noticed, you know. <laughs> We're so blind to ourselves. Now I really notice. I sit down and, and think like, not another student teacher story. Um, you know, it's a setting I've spent a lot of time in. I'm a professor's daughter, so I grew up in an academic setting. I went to school, like many of us, but now I teach school, too. So I've sort of been in academic settings continually from birth. Um, and I find them interesting. I keep finding them interesting. Those teenage years especially, this is your first, the first time you've set a, a novel in high school, right? Yes. Those teenage Absolutely. years are so tumultuous and uh, so intense, and for most of it, it's a time of radical transformation, both physically and mentally. The voices in this book seem just right. How did you get back into that mindset? You know, maybe I shouldn't say this in public, but I didn't have to get back. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it didn't occur to me until after the novel was finished and people started asking me that question that, that I might need to worry. But no, I, I, found the, I found the characters to really be there. And I didn't ever have to think, what would a 15-year-old think? Or how would a 14-year-old say that? Or would a 15-year-old be in this situation? The characters just were the characters to me. And um, thank God it wasn't until the novel was over that I noticed that I actually have a 15-year-old at home my very own, my, my child, my older child is now 15. The idea that my characters and this person, my child, are the same age is like horrifying to me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I look at him silently thinking, you're not like that, are you? Are you? Um, so I don't know, they, the characters were there. They were, they were just there. You write about teenage intimacy in a very intimate way. Yeah. Teenage sexuality. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and again, I my, no, no, my 15-year-old is not allowed to read my book. <laughs> <laughs> All the copies in the house are under lock and key with the alcohol. Yeah, they're in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not his thing anyway. I don't think. No, but as you as you think about this, I mean, how do you write about teenage sexuality at a moment when the characters are just discovering it with such intensity? You know, again, um, and you and I have had very funny conversations in the past about the, the difficulty of the sex scene, right? Didn't you once didn't yes. you once call me late at night to inform me that I'd been nominated for a 
This for a dubious bad, literary prize. That was me. That was the bad sex award from England. <laughs> Which I didn't think was fair, because that award is supposed to be for people who write badly about sex. But Not you, people who write really well about bad sex. Which is what you do. Which is what I do. She <laughs> writes really well about bad sex. There's no award for Just that. Just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> that award you should win. And you didn't win the bad sex award anyhow. No, right? thank God. Yeah. It was an honor just to be nominated, as they say. <laughs> I'm so glad I was the one to tell you that <laughs> night, too. I'd forgotten that. Uh, but you wrote a lot about sex in my education, too, which is another hilarious, brilliant novel. But that's at college level, though, or graduate school level. Uh, but there are challenges in writing about sex, I'm sure. There are definitely challenges. And I think one of the challenges for me has always been to not, to not sugarcoat it or gauzify it or metaphorize it or to, to not write badly, to not bring a lot of really bad, gooey prose to bear on this thing that's very human. Um, and so I think in the effort to write about sex in a way that's straightforward and honest, right. I think I've wound up writing scenes that sometimes make people uncomfortable. Um, with this book particularly because the characters are so young, yeah. I think that there are readers who have sort of um, who have sort of gone whoa, but at the same time, I, you know, like let's not deceive ourselves. No, like these are high school kids do some. I mean, I didn't, but uh, <laughs> high school kids do sometimes have sex. I suppose it's been known to happen. <laughs> Statistically, we have proof that this is happening. Drama course, class. This is not happening in with my high school no. students, but, <laughs> no. but you know. Elsewhere. <laughs> Drama class is the perfect setting, isn't it? Because it's all about learning to manufacture authenticity. Yes. Which is such a metaphor for your teenage <laughs> yes, life. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, how can I best perform, like, you know, spontaneity? Yes. Or you spend yeah. all day trying to look casual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Be cool, uh, <laughs> you know, don't try. Were you one of the drama kids? I wasn't one of the, I wasn't really one of the true drama kids. I was a, I was like a fish out of water drama kid to use like a terrible metaphor. What do you mean? I was in a drama program in high school. Yes. It was a really, uh, it was a really bad choice for me. You weren't good? I was terrible. <laughs> I was so terrible and I was so shy and I was so awkward and well, stiff on Why stage. would you make yourself do that then? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, it's actually one of the mysteries that I haven't really been able to solve. I can, I can penetrate the inner motivations of characters better than my own. I, I tried out for a drama program in a high school. I got in, I was miserable from then on, and I wanted to be a writer, you know? I would like sit in the corner and write in notebooks. Right. I was not made to be on stage. It's a perfect capturing of drama classes. Just everything about the pretentiousness of it, the exercises, the dialogue. I thought it was spot on. But also, the, there's real, like, there is authenticity. I mean, yes. the, the students really, really want, they want to achieve. They want to be stars. They want to get it right. Right. And some are good. And some are good. And some, some are, are not. Right. Um, but they're all, they're all caught up in something that's very... As I recall it, it was, you know, very intense. And writing this book and then actually revising the book, talking to other people I've known who've, you know, even briefly sort of dabbled in acting class, we all remembered that amazing intensity. And vulnerability. Yeah. Right. The charismatic, manipulative teacher is such a common influence in many of our lives. I think your drama teacher, Mr. Kingsley, is the best since Miss Jean Brody. Oh, wow. It's just... I mean, he is... Oh, I might cry, actually. That's, <laughs> thank you, Ron. He is That's a, one of my favorite, like, in my top five of all time. He is a special kind of person in this book. He's a, a serpent of a, of a particular kind. Uh, but he's not, all, he's not all bad. That's no. the thing. I mean, you, you... I wanted readers to understand why it would matter so much to, to have his approval. The kids desperately yeah. want his approval. Yeah, and, and, and the reader needs to, needs to empathize with that. He can't be this two-dimensional villain. That's not interesting. No. That, makes the, that makes the students seem dumb, not and you. they're not dumb. No, they're not dumb. And he's so complex and so witty himself. Was there someone like this in your own life? I've had so many teachers who have had elements 
of that charisma, yeah. that sophistication. Um, I mean, I have other characters, as you know, as you know, who also, you know, fulfill these these characteristics. And yeah, I've had many teachers, many teachers who were dazzling in all of the good ways and in some of the bad ways. And that changes over time. You yeah. look back at some of those teachers and you think, why was I so in love why, with her? Why was I so dazzled? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a certain kind of person. Other people you realize you didn't appreciate enough. Exactly. Again, it's like a force of personality thing. There are right. some teachers out there who do amazing work very quietly. Yes. And you don't realize until years later, wow, that person changed me. Right. There are others who there's a lot of fireworks, you're dazzled, and then later you think, oh my God. Yes. You know. Now, this is the first time ever people have come by my office, several people, and said, I loved that novel. What happened? <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> I mean, much of the pleasure of this novel, and we're going to be very careful in our discussion today not to give anything away, but much of the pleasure of this novel comes in the sudden, bewildering twists that happen twice uh, in the book. Uh, would it be fair to say that this is a novel about how we construct what we know and what we think happened? Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's, it would be fair to say that it's a novel about how we tell our story and who else might be trying to tell our story since our story, our story is usually entangled with somebody else's, usually a lot of somebody else's. So that question of like who's telling the story and who's getting it right, right or wrong in whose opinion, you know, people remember the same event, people who've experienced the same thing right. will remember it very differently. We're used to that sort of uh, conundrum, but what you do in this book is construct that in such a complex way. I'm wondering how you did that physically. Did you have the whole thing planned out and you understood where these twists and turns would take place? God, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I had nothing planned out. I'm not a planner, which is, which is the fun of it. Um, I've never successfully planned a, of anything I've written, actually. But, well, but how can that be? I mean, the first part of the novel is so complete and so compelling, and then we turn a page and everything seems to be, I've been revolutionized. Yeah, that's kind of what happened. I was writing this book. I didn't really, I didn't really have, well, I, I definitely didn't have a plan because I, as I said, I tend not to make plans. Okay. Um, but I didn't, I mean, it's really the only, I have to say, Ron, it's like the only department of my life in which I don't make plans. I'm a big planner. Generally. In general. Okay. Vacations, you know, right. all that stuff. But in my writing, I tend not to plan um, because it, I'm never successful, so I've given up trying. And with this book, I had a different project that I'd been working on for years, years. Mm -hmm. um, if I ever actually tried to plan any project, it was that one. Because this that, other project that this never, other project, never published? As, as of yet, yet no, okay. and, and who knows if it will ever see the light of day. It required all this research and thinking and talking to people, so there was some planning involved there. And it was going so badly, this project, that I would play hooky from it and go work on something else just for fun. And that was what turned into trust exercise eventually, but for a really long time. It was just the writing that I was cheating on my other writing with. So, you know, I would sneak <laughs> off and hide from my failed planned book with, with this other thing. And so I didn't, I, you know, we had no long-term plans together because, like, we weren't supposed to be doing this. <laughs> I was supposed to be writing the other book. It was just a fling. It was just a <laughs> fling. And, I, and I, really, um, I really think that ultimately that was what made the book work, was that I didn't have a lot of premeditation about it. I would sneak off with it for these flings every once in a while, and then I'd put it down for like seven to 10 months a year and give it no wow. thought. Well, I mean, this is meant to be fair, but do you know what happened? <laughs> You're in danger of making the book sound confusing. It's not confusing. It's confounding. Do you know what happened, really? Or is that the point that we cannot know? No, I do know. You do know. Will, will you tell me later? <laughs> <laughs> Your title, I'll move on. Your title, The Trust Exercise, uh, refers to an exercise they do in drama class with Mr. Kingsley uh, with the students. But it has a larger meaning in this context, right, about how we trust one another in relationships and friendships. Can you talk about that? Trust as an exercise? 
trust as an exercise in this book? Yes. Well, I mean, the, I think the main thing that comes out of the first section of the book is, um, on, oh no, I'm in danger of giving things away. You can away. tell everything about the first part. You know, the, the, the thing about this book is that I, I wanted the reader to, to kind of relax and open up into this complicated world of, of emotion and first love and sexual obsession and all, all of these juicy human things. But then um, this question arises, and the question is, is this really the way it went down with these people? Or, or is it possible that, that the person that we've been trusting to tell us what happened has something to hide? And so I think that's where trust comes into the book first and foremost, is, is you suddenly realize that storytelling always has an agenda, right? I mean, even stories that present themselves as being objective right. have an agenda. History, yes. You know, we know that history is, <laughs> history is, is written by people. Right? It doesn't, it doesn't just come down from like some mountain carved on stone slabs. There's always an agenda. So I think the, the question of like, who do we trust to tell our story is one of the things that I was trying to get at with the book. And this book makes us a participant in that process, which I think is really unique and special about this book. Well, because you have to sort of decide who you trust. Exactly, yeah. And there are, there are some competing, uh, there's some different folks competing for your trust. Right. Right, I think it was, it was really a fascinating process to go through. This novel takes place in the 80s, decades before the Me Too movement, but definitely seems very contemporary, very relevant to what we're going through now because yeah. it involves issues of sexual harassment or taking advantage of people, uh, about the complicated exploration of, of our discussion of sexual harassment and the way predators exploit particularly young women. Uh, how have you, been talking to people about that. I mean, I'm sure people must ask, women must ask you about that issue. How does it made you think about that? Well, I mean, one of the things that was so extraordinary about this book was, was the timing of it, but then also I always, you know, because people say like, oh gosh, the book seems like it's about the Me Too movement. Yes. What amazing timing. But on, on the other hand, I always sort of want to make the point that the Me Too movement is, is just a moment in the history of sexual harassment and sexual misconduct, which, which has been going on yes. probably since, since, since there were people. Yes. Um, and so these issues that the book is exploring, the book is set in the 80s. These issues predate the setting of the book. They predate Me Too. Um, but the ways in which as a culture we've started thinking more, um, I mean, I don't know what adverb I wanna use here. It's always a problem in writing adverbs. So I think I'm gonna not use an adverb actually, which is like my little rule. If you're not sure, just don't use an adverb at all. Um, we've, we've been trying to think more about all of these issues and I think um, when I was working on this book, and, and as I said to you, like not really planning or thinking about it, it's, it's not true that I wasn't taking in stuff that was happening in the larger culture. Right. And there, there have been so many, um, so many reassessments of especially educational situations that, that we've been reading about for years and years and years now. Um, the Horace Mann School is one really good example from you know, my neck of the woods. I live in New York where students um, from the 80s who, you know, in, in many cases never said anything until they were adults or parents themselves. And then finally, you know, decades later were able to say, um, this situation that I was in educationally wasn't, wasn't right. right. It wasn't right, but I was, I was never really able to speak about that until now. And so I was, I was thinking a lot about this and reading a lot about this and thinking a lot about the ways in which our cultural norms have changed over just like the, the handful of decades since, I mean, I'm not that old, you know? And um, the 80s were a really, really different time. We, as students, I think, um, accepted certain behaviors that I would, I would never accept such things if they were happening in my child's school. But it was, it was, so it's remarkable the evolution. I think we've evolved a really long way in a really short time, but it's also remarkable how long it took like, why did it take so long for us to sit back and go, 
you know, wait a minute, like the way in which this teacher is interacting with these very young students, the, the, there's something fishy about this. It just doesn't seem right. Right. You know, so, it's and, and, we're, and we're still dealing with it. Right. Colson Whitehead's book, uh, The Nickel Boys, made me think that. What took so long? Why, I and mean, people, and you go back and you see people were reporting on this school throughout the whole period of its life. Over and over again, the scandal would be revealed and then the outrage would just sort of dissipate and the school went on. Yeah, yeah, uh, but we can say that about so many things. What took so long? Yeah. And we'll keep saying it. These women are not helpless in this book. They're not. No, they're not helpless, but it's complicated. It's complicated for them. Um, I mean, one of the characters in this book is, as a young woman, involved in a very um, damaging relationship with a man who is much older than she is. She's a minor. You know, she's 16 years old. Right. When she becomes entangled with this man, this man is much older. He's in a position of trust, as we say. He's a teacher. Yes. And she really struggles as an adult with the question of her own agency. You know, to what extent was she an agent in this situation? And what she's unable to see, even as an adult, this character is um, the, the degree to which she was powerless. Yeah, she wasn't helpless, but she was, she was a 16-year-old student, and this was a teacher invested with all of the authority that a teacher is invested with. So even if she might have thought at 16, oh, you know, I liked his attention. Right. You know, what, what culture is it that tells a 16-year-old girl, one of the straightest paths to achievement and significance for you, 16-year-old girl, is to capture the attention of an older man? That's a cultural message. Right. You know, and if a 16-year-old girl hears that message and falls prey to it, and later when she's 30 looks back and thinks that was my fault, she's still not really seeing the big picture. Right. The novel, this novel explores that in the most interesting and provocative and thoughtful way. Thank you. <laughs> Would you be willing to take some questions of from course. the audience? Can we please ask that the questions not spoil any of the twists or suspense in the plot? There are people here who would like to read the book and have that, That's that a surprise. Tall order. I know it is a tall order, so I ask you to police yourselves. Also, we are completely We can't see you. Not at all. <laughs> it's completely black out there. Uh, the lights are so bright. So uh, wave your hands around, and uh, Susan would, will uh, point to you and take your questions. Oh, I, I see a hand waving. Yes. Hi, how you doing? Um, Ron, you're the best. Um, <laughs> Susan, thank you very much. This is a great book. So I'm kind of sorry to ask you this question, but um, <clears throat> there are some similarities and structures that felt to me to Lisa Halliday's asymmetry, not in, the, not in the plot or anything along those lines. So uh, just in the, in, in the structure of it. And I'm wondering when someone else, another writer comes out with a book that has that has some of the structure you're using while you're still writing it or whatnot, do you just kind of go, oh, damn, that sucks, or what do you think? That's interesting. Um, I mean, luckily I didn't, I, you know, in the case of this book, no. I wasn't, I was pretty fortressed while I was working on this book from, from sort of what, what might have been going on elsewhere in publishing, and I didn't, um, I didn't, really worry even after I knew about asymmetry and, and knew about like the, the, I think, structural similarities. The books still seem to be pretty different. Um, I mean, going back deeper in my career, I did, I did have like a complete meltdown the year that um, two books about the Patty Hearst kidnapping, two great, two, two great novels about the Patty Hearst kidnapping and not both of them written by me came out very, very close together. Um, mine and, and Christopher Sorrentino's great book, Trance, and I did at the time feel like the world had come to an end, but it hadn't. <laughs> the world has room for both, so it was okay. Thank you. You really do need to wave your hand. We can't see you. I'm not sure if we have another question as yet, Come so. On. Back here, please, in the oh. microphone. I think there's someone there. But... She's making her way over. Okay. Okay. All right. Why don't we ask each other questions while we wait for the question? <laughs> <laughs> Say it. 
Hello, thank Hi. you. Um, I had a question about like your narrative process. Earlier on, you were discussing how you uh, prefer not to plan when you're writing and just to go spontaneously. So how would you describe uh, your process of creating characters and worlds and tying them together when you're first trying to create a new narrative novel or book? Because I don't plan. Um, so just to make sure I understand the question, um, it was a question about sort of how I build narrative, um, yes. given that I don't kind of engage in like outlining or other sort of pre-writing. Pre um, that's a great question. And I think the answer is that a lot, of, a lot of that work for me happens in the writing, as strange as that sounds. I write a lot, um, by which I mean I sit down and generate prose as much as I can. I always tell my students whenever I get them at the beginning of a semester that I want them to write every day because that's kind of an ideal that I try to fulfill. I fail most days. Um, but when I'm kind of in active writing mode, <laughs> which is usually like, you know, um, as, as many days as I can manage it. I, I, I sit down and try to fill a page with writing, and I don't really think a lot about what that writing is going to be about. Um, I have written thousands upon thousands of pages of just stuff waiting for something that will seize my attention and compel me to build on it. And what seizes my attention is almost always a situation between characters who feel to me as if they have the spark of life in them, to be honest. I mean, I've written lots and lots of prose about places and things and conversations, just, just all sorts of stuff that is description. But every once in a while, as I'm generating my daily writing, a situation emerges. And it's a situation that has tension in it. It usually has all those things your writing teacher taught you to try to infuse your stories with in high school, conflict. Um, the thing with me is that I, I find it really hard to sit down and invent a conflict, to sit down and invent tension. It's really hard to sit down and say, I'm gonna write a story today about people in enormous conflict. Um, you know, that's a great way to just have writer's block for the rest of the day, like what do you do? Um, so I just try to write stuff, I have a lot of generative tricks that I use. You know, I often just start describing something that I saw and allow the associative process to carry me wherever it will. With trust exercise, I, as I said, was escaping a, a difficult project that was um, just not yielding to all my efforts. And I sat down one day and thought, I'm just gonna write something really short today. And the first sentence that I wrote was, neither could drive. And I thought, well, who are they? And immediately I knew. I, I thought, they're, these are teenage, teenage kids. They're in love. And they want to get together, but nobody has a driver's license. There's no public transit. What will they do? So that was, that was a moment at which the sentence started spooling out conflict and desire, problems that I wanted to solve. And it ended up being the first sentence of this book. Um, the rest of your question, I think, can only be answered by really sort of specific and not general statements. You know, once I have that situation, I just try to pursue it as far as I can. Thank try you. to build on it. Thanks. Thank you. There's another question. Yeah. Um, hi. hi. Uh, so you touched on this a lot, um, but what do you think is so fraught about that sort of student-teacher relationship where both like, why is the teacher so interested in the student in maybe not only in predatory ways? And then what sort of draw is there for that student also not inherently predatory or angelic? Yeah, yeah. that's a great question. Um, oh, wow, I feel like I could answer that in another book. No. <laughs> you know, the, the, I, I mean, as, as someone who, um, so I've been teaching now at the high school and the college level for about half my life. And it only gets more interesting. I have to say the, the, um, the struggle and the drama of trying to teach is, is just bottomlessly fascinating. It, it, never, it never gets simpler. And I think there are a lot of reasons why. I think one reason has to do with um, power and how confusing it is 
to think about and to talk about power in a pedagogical situation because in a pedagogical situation, you want, on the one hand, a feeling of equality and colleagueship between yourself and your student. Um, I always want to treat my students as equals. I, I learn a lot from my students, um, possibly more than they learn from me. It depends on the year. And so there is this dream of or an idea of equality that I think is incredibly important, but at the same time, it's not an equal relationship at all. Hmm. The student is not the teacher's equal. There is a power imbalance between those two halves. And so that contradiction alone, I think, leads the way to a lot of the really um, complicated and thorny issues in the student-teacher relationship. And it's very similar, I think, in a lot of ways to the parent-child relationship, especially now that I'm a parent and um, you know, find myself in struggles with my children that aren't so dissimilar to struggles with my students, where I both want to be, I, I want my children to feel that they're my equal, that I'm their ally, that they can always come to me, and at the same time, there's still an authority relationship there, right? They're still my child. So, so I, think that, I think that that contradiction between the equality that we want and that imbalance of authority, I think that that's, for me at the heart of why the teacher-student relationship is so complex. Um, and then I just think that also learning in our country is an incredibly endangered activity and... Um, endangered by what? Well, so many things. Um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't wanna go too far off into the, to, into the political realm here in the nation's capital, but... Um, <laughs> You're among friends, I bet. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, just to put it simply, like teachers are really stressed at like every level of teaching in our country. I think teachers are really, really stressed and they're not receiving the respect and the support that they deserve institutionally or culturally. And so their job gets harder as what they do gets more and more important. I mean, how many things that are happening in our culture right now do we think might be due to the failures of our educational system? A, a lot. Like, I, I think we could trace our biggest crises, and I'm not gonna name them, but I would say that, what one I would say is environmental and one I would say is governmental. Um, I would say that we could trace these crises to failures in our educational system to a populace that isn't as educated as it should be or could be. Um, everyone deserves to be educated and you know, students aren't getting education and teachers aren't getting support in providing it. And, and so I think that that's leading to a lot of tension also. I think teachers are stressed, students are stressed. Teachers and students are stressed out. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't even think that begins to answer your question, but thank you for asking it. <laughs> we have another question here. When you set something in a particular time period, in this case it was the 80s, do you intentionally think about whether you want to include some historical things that were going on to make that time period come alive, or do you try to leave that out to make it more universal for every oh, time period? That's a really great question. Um, you know, in the, in the case of trust exercise, I, I didn't want to, um, I didn't ever want to hammer on it's the 80s, you know. I didn't want to. I didn't want to mention parachute pants or, uh, um, you know, Human League or any of the other great things about the 80s that I loved. But um, but it was important that it was the 80s. So I think that just from a craft perspective, what I always want to try to do if I'm writing something that is set in a time period other than the present is to try to evoke that time period really organically, just in every, in every fiber of the story without having to like uh, stick little flags in the story that say, it's the 80s, you know, uh, without having to like have Ronald Reagan on TV giving a State of the Union address. I want the world to be the world as it was then, and, and so, how do I do that? It depends on what the concerns of the story are. And with trust exercise, what it really was about was, was this whole 
question of the teacher-student relationship and how different that was several decades ago, how differently thought of that was, um, all of the aspects of it that weren't really thought a lot about. Right. And so in, that was the way in which, to me, it was the 80s, if that makes sense, that these cultural and social norms and mores were different. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to get hung up on you know, people's, people's musical tastes or their hair, although one of the characters does, um, in a way that I found poignantly 80s, sorry, she does try to go punk, you know, like years too late, because like <laughs> punk had that highly delayed arrival in the American suburbs. <laughs> so it's like, you know, many, many years after the Sex Pistols, she's like got a punk t-shirt on. Um, but for the most part, I try to do time period through just what, what it was socially and culturally like at that time, if that's relevant to the story. You have written several, they're not really called historical novels, but they're definitely based on particular historical events. Uh, do you find that uh, structure, was it more freeing not to have that, to just invent everything? Or do you find you like that kind of, to base a story on some historical event that we all know, Patty Hearst or the Unabomber? Yeah, yeah, I mean, in the, in the cases of both of those novels, I, it wasn't so much that I wanted the structure as I became so incredibly obsessed with the historical event that the only way that I could really get over it was to explore it fictionally. Um, because, you know, fiction gives you the opportunity to try to figure out what all that stuff that doesn't make it into the paper might have been, right. right? Which isn't to knock journalism at all, but journalism doesn't necessarily tell you how everybody felt. Right. And, um, and that was the thing that was fascinating to me about the Patty Hearst kidnapping, how did it feel, you know, um, for those very, very, very young people to do what they did? Um, so I, I think that it's more that I get obsessed with a real historical event and fiction is the way that I work that out. Hmm. Fascinating. Anything else? I see a sign that says five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> what are you working on now? This other project that has dragged on and on. Yeah, so the other project that's dragged on and on, I literally drag it around now. I managed to, I have this sort of like obsessive compulsive disorder with, with, with disorder. Um, I, I couldn't stand how disordered this project was, so I decided that it all had to fit into a do people know the Container Store? Are people fans of the Container Store? Yes, so yes. I really love the Container Store. And um, they make these clear plastic shoe boxes with a lid. So the, this is the best box for a manuscript that's ever been made. It's made for like a men's shoe, but it's a great manuscript box. You can enclose the manuscript, you can still see it, <laughs> and it can still see you. But it's become a discrete object. And in a way, it feels like you've taken care of it. <laughs> so that's where that project is now. It's in a container store shoebox. And I, and I took it with me on all my travels this summer, and I never opened it. <laughs> never opened the box. So nice. That's nice. It's just, it's the first time I've had a chance to meet you. It's been such a pleasure. I think it's you're such a such brilliant novelist. It's been such a pleasure novelist. to meet you. Well, uh, please go buy this book if you haven't already read it. If you have read it, buy a, buy a copy for a friend. <laughs> or five. <laughs> Thank you. And, and once you buy your copy, you can get Susan to sign it at 4.30 at the signing table. Yes, right. that's right. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. This is great fun for me.